Okay. Hello, everyone. Good morning, afternoon. No, it's actually, it's definitely afternoon where I am. Could be morning on the West Coast, though. Um, switch your chat to everyone um, and let us know where you're calling in from today. Um, New York City, I was just there, fall is in the air. Oh, and your name is Autumn, perfect. Um, Oakland, Chicago, Long Beach, sounds amazing. Fiamma, you're in Brooklyn, I'm in Charlottesville, Virginia. I don't know why, I this never gets old to me. I say this on every webinar. So if you've ever been on any conversation with me, you know that I say the same thing at the beginning. But I like truly love to see where everyone is in the world. Um, I haven't seen any, well, Canada, okay. I'm like, that's international. Um, Atlanta, we'll give it a minute for people to join um, before we kick it off officially. Fiam and I were just um, shutting doors and telling people to stay away, including animals and dogs, but we can't control them. So <laughs> you all will likely meet my dog Otter at some point. <laughs> uh, warning. I always give people warnings. Thankfully my preschooler is not in the house. Cause you would definitely see her make an appearance, uh, if she was here as well. Uh, dogs and toddlers, they love to um, appear when they're not supposed to. Amazing. Okay, so the numbers are climbing here as people join, but I think we can probably kick things off. Keep telling us where you're calling in from. Um, and also, like, why you're excited about this conversation. I always... Um, wonder like where people are coming in um just in terms of like their mindset or what they're hoping to get out of a conversation so also feel free to share that if you're open to it in the chat um i am personally thrilled to be joined today by fiamma jean baptiste um who's the founder and ceo of more uh, and we're gonna have a discussion today about the current state as well as the future of DEIB at work. So diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Um, when Fiam and I met, I was really struck by just the personal journey that she shared that led her to founding her own company, which is called MORE, uh, which stands for Mask Off Retreats and Experiences. And you can share more about this, Fiamma, but your mission and commitment is to offer Black women a safe space to remove the mask uh, and embrace their full potential. So our conversation today will cover the current landscape of DIB. Um, and Fiamma is going to share with us her what she sees as the latest strategies and challenges uh, associated with this landscape. But also, I think the conversation ultimately um, will should turn to, you know, the continued need and commitment to cultivate these inclusive environments that um, I think we've seen sort of the commitment go up and down in recent years. So, and given the focus of the on this company, uh, parts of this conversation will be centered around the experience of Black women in the workplace. So I'm super excited to just not only have the conversation uh, at large about DIB, but also like bring the focus back um, to the impact that it has on Black women. So I'm going to let Fiamma introduce herself in a second. Um, but very quickly, for those of you who are not familiar with me or Bravely, I'm Sarah Sheehan. I'm the founder and CEO of Bravely. We are a coaching, learning, and leadership development platform, and everything we do is designed to support employees at every level, um, and then hopefully meet the unique needs of the organizations that we're partnering with. We have long-standing relationships with Zillow Group, Pinterest, the New York Times, the NBA, Etsy, 
uh, and many other well-known organizations. Um, and they offer our coaching and our training in some cases to their employees. So a lot of people know us more as a coaching platform, but we've now moved into manager training. And we have always had in our DNA at Bravely this commitment to equitable access and supporting people who've been overlooked or historically marginalized in the workplace. So holding conversations like the one we're having today is very important to us as an organization. And I'm just incredibly grateful to be sharing this space with you, Fiona. Thank you, Sarah. So I'd love to just kick things off and have you share your background and that personal journey that inspired you to just kick corporate America to the curb uh, and found more. Absolutely. First, thank you and to the Bravely team for having me today. Uh, my journey into founding more was deeply rooted in my personal experience in corporate America and tech, building my career in sales and revenue enablement, which are typically homogenous in nature. I experienced firsthand and observed the unique challenges Black women like myself face in the workplace every day. There's a constant pressure to wear a metaphorical mask, to conform to certain norms, and to navigate systemic biases. And it takes a toll not only on me, but on countless others and our well being. Mm -hmm. um, for the folks on the call, I'd like to highlight that many Black women often feel isolated in their workplaces, being either the only or one of very few Black women on their teams. And this isolation can have significant consequences, such as eroding our self esteem, causing imposter syndrome, and leading to mental and emotional uh, burnout. This isolation can also perpetuate a sense of invisibility where our voices and our contributions are overlooked. And these aren't just my opinions or observations. Uh, Lean In, the State of Black Women in Corporate America report, states that 54% of Black women say they are often the onlys and they're having an especially difficult time and experience in the workplace in comparison to their non-Black peers. And to take that a step further, this year's The State of Self-Care of Black Women study by the Exhale app indicates that 36% of Black women have left the workplace due to feeling unsafe. I say all that to say, I realized there was a pressing need for a platform that would not only acknowledge the challenges that Black women face, but also sheds light on how widespread of an issue it is. And that's what led me to establish more, where our mission is twofold. We're committed to empowering and supporting Black women in their early and mid-career stages, helping them navigate and advance their careers, but equally important, we're dedicated to creating a safe space for Black women to remove their masks, surrounded by a like-minded community that understands the challenges we experience at work in many ways that our colleagues won't. And this dual mission drives everything we do at more. Love it. Thank Love you. that you founded this company. Love that you know, you're doing the work to really elevate like some of the statistics that you just shared, because I think there's a an understanding for the most part that, you know, obviously black women are marginalized, not just in the workplace, in the world. Um, but I'm curious for, from your perspective, like for the folks on this call, um, are there other stories, unique experiences that you can share with us or ultimately like, what do you want us as the founder of more to walk away with from this conversation? Like what's the most important thing for us to understand? Like as we move into a conversation about DEIB, but specifically as we're talking about the work that you're doing to support black women, like what's the most important takeaways for us today or that you would want us to, to leave with? Sounds like the last question I should be asking, but um, I really wanna center us on that so that um, the audience can ask you questions as well, or, or we can really be reflective as we have this conversation. I, it's interesting that you're asking that question now. I, I said I wasn't going to have the chat open so I wouldn't be distracted, but a comment just came in about what about other women? So mm -hmm. I, I think what I would like folks to walk away from our call and our chat today with is understanding how the challenges Black women face in the workplace are somewhat of a shared experience with other women, but there are specific challenges that Black women face that others don't. So there is a ton of opportunity and resources available for women, but specifically to this conversation, I want people to understand what those challenges are for Black women. 
Yeah. And you touched on some of this, but I think it's important because the question's just been asked, right? Um, you know, I've, I'm a woman, I've definitely faced challenges, but really seeking out um, more understanding within the Black community, like I've come to understand just there's a ton of privilege associated with me being a white woman, even though, yes, I've faced challenges um, in the workplace and in the world, but it's it's not, in, in comparison, it's not anywhere close to what you've just shared. And and is there, there more you can share with us about those unique challenges? How much time do we have? <laughs> uh, I absolutely can. <laughs> I, I suspect this isn't new information to the folks on the call, um, but Black women often find ourselves at the intersection of race and gender discrimination, right? Where we're facing biases and stereotypes related to both our gender and our race. And some of those being uh, frequent experiences with microaggressions. And I don't want to make assumptions that everyone on the call knows what a microaggression is. So for the sake of making sure we're all on the same page, a microaggression uh, microaggressions, excuse me, are comments or actions that subtly demean or dismiss someone based on their gender, race, or other aspects of their identity. Mm -hmm. And since Black women face both racism and sexism, we experience a wider range of microaggressions than women overall. And <laughs> to give you guys a, a picture, right? Imagine being early in your career as the only Black person on your team and being regularly referred to as Roscoe's chicken and waffles by your white boss and his white male peer. And some of you might not get that racist cheap attempt of a joke. DM me later, I'll explain it to you. Uh, but that's one of many examples of microaggressions I've personally experienced in my career. And microaggressions may seem insignificant when they're viewed as isolated events, but when they occur day after day, as they often do, they, the impact builds up and it takes a toll. And then there's the persistent lack of representation of Black women in leadership roles, making it challenging for us to find relatable role models or mentors. And research from leanin.org indicates that 21% of C-suite leaders are women. Only 4% are women of color. Only 1% are Black women. So that highlights the challenges Black women are facing in breaking through the dual barriers I just mentioned. But the lack of representation isn't just at the executive level, right? And McKinsey and Company reports that companies have successfully hired Black people in the frontline and entry-level jobs, and there's a significant drop-off in any level thereafter. While frontline jobs should serve as a springboard for advancing your career, they largely do not connect Black employees with sufficient opportunities to advance. And speaking of opportunities to advance, the joint report by Lean In and McKinsey uh, called Women in the Workplace. They reveal that Black women are much less likely than their non-Black colleagues to interact with senior leaders at work. This lack of access is mirrored in a lack of sponsorship. Less than a quarter of Black women feel they have the sponsorship needed to advance their career. It also means Black women are less likely to be included in important conversations about company priorities and strategy, and they have fewer opportunities to get noticed by people in leadership. And if that's not enough, Black women continue to face wage disparities, earning less than our white counterparts for the same exact work. According to the Institute of Women's Policy Research, on average, Black women are paid 38% less than white men and 21% less than white women. Understanding these challenges is crucial for the community joining today to recognize the unique experiences that Black women are facing and acknowledgement and an attempt to understand are the first steps in creating a more inclusive and equitable workplace. That's right. I think that's, uh, for me, just hearing everything that you just said, like that's, in some cases, I think those of us that already knew this, it's still just something that has to be restated and repeated all mm -hmm. the time uh, because it's just, clearly not changing or moving as quickly as we needed to. Um, and someone just put in the chat, like it's a thousand paper cuts of daily microaggressions. And mm. I think that's exactly right. Uh, when you think about, 
you know, asking people to continue to be resilient in the face of that, it's, uh, it's almost unfathomable, fathomable, if you think about it. Um, and they are really powerful statistics and they're not just statistics. Like this is reality, right? Like we have to internalize what you've just shared and then think about how that shows up every day in the lives of black women. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, and maybe you can share more about this, like in terms of what you're hoping to achieve with more, you know, because I'm sure there's like countless things <clears throat> or outcomes that you're hoping to produce over time. But when you think about just all of the statistics that you just shared about people entering the workplace, but maybe not getting the opportunities past like that entry level or not seeing more people that look like them in leadership roles. Like what is your hope with more? And, and we're going to talk more in a little bit about how you work with organizations, but you know, ultimately like what are you hoping to, to achieve um, in bringing people together? I'm glad you asked. Uh, we believe black women deserve more. Mm -hmm more support, more advocacy, more money. Our vision is nothing short of transformative. We aspire to create a seismic shift in the corporate landscape. Our high level goal is to be the catalyst for change, rewriting the narrative for black women in the workplace. We're forging a path towards a future where black women are not just included, but celebrated, not mm -hmm. just surviving, but thriving, right? You mentioned resiliency. The resilience isn't because we want to, it's because we have to, to survive. And more aims to break down barriers, dismantle biases, and create a world where Black women can lead with confidence, authenticity, and purpose. Mm -hmm. Envision a world where the experiences, voices, and contributions of Black women are not only valued, but central to shaping the future of organizations and communities. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to elaborate more extensively in our conversation, but we're creating a movement. Also, I think it doesn't go without saying it needs to be said that, you know, there's there's um, often something that's like been brought to my attention a lot is just like the amount of belief that goes into Black women and the necessity for people to understand the bias that they bring into the workplace so that they are not, you know, going into autom automatic pilot around like, you know, not trusting, believing based on their own racial bias. Um, is that something that you see, you know, when you think about the way that the Black women are treated or perceived in the workplace? Like, is it, I mean, this is all just basically like wrapped or under the umbrella, you know, of bias. Do you see that being, and, and we didn't talk about this before, but, you know, as you're speaking, I'm just thinking like there's, there's so much that work that has to be done around supporting black women, but it seems like really helping people understand the bias that they have up front would be the natural first step. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, you know, I, I have uh, some conflicting feelings about implicit bias trainings, but there are, there's so much value in helping people recognize that we all have biases. We do. And how you check those biases is our, our responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting at the report that we're going to drop at the end of the, one of the reports that we're going to drop at the end of the call highlights how black women are required to defend their competency more than any of their other peers, where they almost have to defend the expertise that they've built over their career, no matter how tenured they are. So there, there's an opportunity for folks to check their biases, but it's an ongoing process. It's not a one and done type thing. Right. Someone's also referring to just met Black women as it relates to medical care. It's like the, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not the same as the workplace um, because obviously you're your life is at risk in these, a lot of these circumstances, um, not that your life isn't at risk at work too, in some cases as well, but, um, it's that theme and trend of just, you know, not believing 
when a black woman speaks up um, and they're usually right. Absolutely. It's, it's incredible. And this will take us on a far left path. So maybe it'll bring it, maybe we can bring it back <laughs> after this. However, black women um, are, are notoriously not believed by doctors when it comes to their pain. That's why our mortality rates when giving childbirth are so high in comparison to every other race in the world. Uh, mm. You asked me earlier, would well, what people to walk away with uh, by the end of this call? Believe Black women. That's mm -hmm. what I. That's what I want us to walk away with. Yeah, that just gave me chills just thinking about you know not someone not believing uh, the level of pain that you're experiencing just based on you know, their own bias. It's pretty, I mean, we all know it to be true, but, um, it's, you know, sometimes difficult to just reflect on this, um, and think about like the consequences associated with not believing someone. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's talk more about DIB more broadly. Um, and I had referred earlier to, that we've seen the focus shift up and down. It's almost like a roller coaster, right? In recent years. Um, and I'd say the the high point most ha recently happening in 2020 following the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery. And I would, you know, it's so funny because it's not funny, but it's so interesting when you think back to that time because. Breonna Taylor and Ahmad were actually murdered before George Floyd was, but then that's really when, you know, everyone started to take a look at and reflect on, you know, what in, in the workplace, like a, more broadly in the world, obviously this was happening, but we saw this quick action and commitment by companies to invest in DIB um, and we saw, you know, more action than we've seen in some time, right? And it did feel in the moment, and I don't know if this is true for you, so I'd love for you to share that. But, um, you know, it felt almost like, okay, we're climbing this mountain. There's no way we're going to slide back down it, you know, like this is, you, you can't come back from this. Um, and it feels like we have. What, what are your thoughts? Are we sliding back right now, or did we slide all the way back? It, it's an important observation to make. Mm -hmm. And one, if we're going to address, we have to address candidly. In the wake of the murders of Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and George Floyd, there was indeed a significant surge in awareness and commitment of DEIB efforts within organizations. Mm -hmm. We witnessed public statements and Black Lives Matter banners, uh, prominently displayed on websites. We saw focus groups with Black employees from leadership oftentimes listening for the first time. And it seemed like we were at a turning point where organizations recognized the urgent need for change and pledged to do better. However, it's crucial to recognize that in some cases, these actions were performative. They mm. were designed to appease public sentiment without actually enacting substantive change. As time passed, we absolutely have seen a regression in the dedication to DEIB efforts in various organizations. Um, Hugh, a wonderful organization, their state of inequity report uh, states that 84% of employees surveyed said their company has not addressed the mental or emotional impact of discrimination on its employees since June of 2020. <laughs> they said... Also, 81% of employees report that their employers haven't increased recruiting efforts toward racially diverse hiring. Mm -hmm. With the overturning of affirmative action by the Supreme Court, it sends a disheartening signal, right? When the highest court in America questions or limits policies aimed at promoting diversity, equity, and, and inclusion, it's no wonder companies are so comfortable backsliding and why they're not championing these values wholeheartedly. I'd love to pose a question to the audience. A couple of questions, actually. How much focus does DEIB have at your companies today? And is it properly resourced and championed by your executive team? <clears throat> and are leaders held accountable when DEIB goals are not achieved in the same way they're held accountable when sales or marketing goals are not achieved? Mm -hmm. I'll add the questions to the chat. 
Mm -hmm. There we go. And as you all are answering, these questions reflect not just a need for commitment, right, but also accountability and DEIB efforts. It's essential that the strategy and the initiatives are not just buzzwords, but backed by concrete actions and consequences for inaction. Mm -hmm. I'm reading the answers, <laughs> performative lip service. It's so interesting because I think, um, you know, what you were just saying about the Supreme Court overturning affirmative action, it's, um, it absolutely does, I think, give people, you know, the license or companies, even the license, even if they don't say it outwardly, it allows them to take a step back and say, you know, we don't, we don't really have to focus on this. Right. We don't really have to, you know, do what we thought we had to, um, because, you know, the leadership of our country isn't doing that. Right. Um, and before we talk about accountability, because I think it's like very related now that you've brought up the Supreme Court, what, like absolutely one of the things that I'm terrified about, and I was just visiting my parents this week and talking about it at breakfast with them was just how the next election cycle could impact, you know, the racial tension that we have experienced, I mean, over time, right? Since the beginning of time, it feels like, but, you know, in particular, during the last election cycle. And ever since then, we've seen like a very different um, environment that's probably going to once again, you know, begin to feel um, like, like that there's like agency to go out there and be much more upfront about racism and things that maybe have historically been hidden in the workplace, but that absolutely um, add to that feeling of I'm not safe or, you know, that that stat that you shared about 36% of women leaving the work, black women leaving the workforce because they actually don't feel safe. Um, how do you think that this is going to impact companies as they, as the election years, right? We have a year, but it's going to, it's, you know, it's all going to begin in the coming months. And I want to talk about like how we hold companies accountable, but I think we can also layer in like, how can we start preparing for what's potentially to come and protect those that work for us that are a part of these marginalized groups, you know, that feel this threat in a very different way than I would. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, how do we begin to start having these conversations? And then how do we hold each other accountable is like the next wave of this, because but, it's, it's just, it's going to start again soon where um, it's not that it doesn't exist right now. I certainly don't want to pretend that this isn't at play every day of, of our lives and in your life, but it feels like it will likely get worse in the near yeah. term. I, I agree with that assertion. It, it likely will heighten, right, with the next election, but I, I, I want to take a step back and say that racism for black and brown people has never been hidden. It's been hidden from the masses. This is something we've always experienced, right? And mm -hmm. I think with uh, the election and people feeling more emboldened to express their racism is one thing, but to say it was hidden, it never has been hidden. It's something that we've experienced for quite a long time in the workplace and outside of the workplace. Now, to answer the question that you asked, um, how do we address the racial tensions that are likely to arise in the workplace, right? And outside of the workplace mm -hmm. with this new election. And I'm personally a fan of open and honest communication. Mm -hmm. Companies like to take a, a, a stance of uh, not addressing or discussing politics in the office. And I, I think that's the wrong approach. Mm -hmm. We know this election's coming. Um, so leaders should proactively engage their employees and give them an opportunity to inform how they wanna be supported during these racially charged intense periods, especially mm -hmm. during elections. Being reactionary is definitely not the answer. Mm -hmm. um, 
open dialogue surveys, focus groups can help gather insights and ensure that the support provided aligns with the employee's needs. Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> when it comes to staying neutral or discussing politics or not discussing politics at work, it's going to have an impact on a company's DEIB strategy without question. While the intention behind this approach may be to maintain a harmonious work environment, it can inadvertently silence important conversations about social and political issues that disproportionately affect marginalized communities, including Black women. Mm -hmm. In many cases, political issues are deeply intertwined with diversity, equity, and inclusion. Moreover, it's crucial to recognize, right, that there is no neutrality in the struggle against racism. Dr. Ibram X. Kendi aptly states in, his, states in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, one either allows racial inequities to persevere as a racist or confronts racial inequities as an anti-racist. There is no in-between, and the claim of not racist or neutrality is a mask for racism. Therefore, by actively engaging in conversations about racial tensions in the election and supporting their employees during these crucial times, companies can take more meaningful step in confronting racial inequities um, and fostering a more inclusive and equitable workforce. There is no neutrality. That's that's the headline. And how would you suggest, because there is, I think, a base camp was a company that was famously on record around the last election saying, we're not going to talk about politics here. And then I think a third of their workforce left. Um, you know, like their message was, if you don't like it, you can leave. And then people left. Was that okay? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then they had to come back and apologize, but there's, you know, what it, it's, it's really, I, again, I'm not speaking for myself here, but I think the claim will be like, it's really tricky if you go on record and say like one candidate or one party is, even if it's so clear, they, you know, are supporting um, racism. It's, you know, like that neutrality piece, I think it can get watered down in terms of like, I don't want to, I don't want to get involved in this conversation or start like pointing to one um, political party over another. Like, I think a lot of companies would say that, right? So how do we, you know, what would you suggest as we enter into this period and start navigating these conversations? Because like that's just going to stick in my brain over and over. Like there is no neutrality, right? So it's it's being bold enough to stand up and call a spade a spade. And right. I haven't I haven't honestly seen a lot of companies like they will stand up and make statements around not supporting racism, but they won't directly correlate it or tie it to something specific. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you suggest even for those like who are navigating this in people roles that probably want to stand up and scream it from the mountaintops, but are limited because we all have jobs that we get paid for. You know, how do we do this? How do we navigate it? I don't have the answer to that. And because I didn't have the answer, I started my own company so I could say what I want to say and make a stance boldly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love that answer actually, because it's the truth. Um, so let's talk then about just accountability. Like how do we hold companies and leaders? So using that even as the example, um, you know, if a company is not like being direct or supporting the efforts that they claim to be, you know, attached to, how, how do we hold them accountable? Or if they're standing up and making statements about, um, you know, the practices within their organization that are going, or the investments that they're going to make in DIV, how do we hold them accountable to that? There are far more qualified people to discuss what strategies can be deployed to ensure our companies are being held accountable, right? They've dedicated to their, li their life to DIV work. So I, I don't have an expert 
opinion here, but I do realize that DEIB isn't a one size fits all concept. Mm-hmm. It's not. Mm-hmm. It requires a tailored approach based on an, on, on an organization's specific goals, um, their culture, and the challenges that they're experiencing. So I don't know if there's a blanket way to do that. With that being said, though, there are some fundamental principles that are applied to other prioritized areas of the business that can guide the process for accountability. First and mm-hmm. foremost, setting clear and measurable goals and defining what success looks like in terms of DEIB, establishing key performance indicators. That's probably the first step any company should take for accountability when it comes to DEIB goals, right? And then DEIB and accountability requires transparency and reporting. So how often are companies talking about these goals and where they're tracking? They need to regularly communicate their efforts and the results to their employees, their shareholders, and the public. That's a Mm -hmm. perfect way to hold people accountable. Um, Mm -hmm. And making sure that these statements, these initiatives, these efforts aren't just performative, that they're actually being measured. Um, Transparency holds organizations accountable for their commitments, and it allows stakeholders to assess the progress along the way. And then third, accountability requires consequences for noncompliance. Just as organizations hold employees accountable for their job performance, they should hold leaders and teams accountable for meeting DEIB goals. Mm-hmm. They involve performance evaluations, promotions, compensation adjustments based on their DEIB uh, outcomes. Mm-hmm. We all know people's money, if they're depe- if it was dependent on their DEIB goals, they would care a little bit more. Ultimately, accountability um, and DEIB is about fostering a a culture of ownership, uh, responsibility, and commitment at all levels of the organization. It's not enough to just have good intentions. There has to be a systematic and sustained effort to create change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what you just said about the consequence, that's where, do you think that that's why it's so difficult for companies to like maintain the priorities? Because yeah, yeah. there aren't like the consequences or enough consequences at stake. Yeah, that's a part of it. I, I think there are several factors at play. Um, one significant factor is resistance to change, right? So yes, there aren't strong enough consequences, but folks don't like change. And increasing and implementing DEIB efforts requires a fundamental cultural shift within organizations. The shift can be met with a lot of resistance from individuals or groups within organizations who are comfortable with the status quo. So that's one of the reasons. And then competing priorities also plays a crucial role. Many organizations are juggling numerous initiatives, especially with uh, reductions in force happening left and right. People are wearing multiple hats. When DEIB is not clearly prioritized with measurable goals, it's easy for it to take a back seat. Amongst Mm -hmm. the hundreds of other things folks have to do with their jobs. Without Mm -hmm. clear metrics and consequences for noncompliance, DEIB may be perceived as optional, right? And using your language, let's call a spade a spade, DEIB work is hard and it requires expertise and dedication and resilience and there's no magic wand for it. Um, It involves addressing white supremacy systemic biases, policies and practices that have been in place for years. And these challenges exist, but they also can serve as as excuses. And while resistance to change and competing priorities and complexity are real, they're not insurmountable challenges. The commitment to DEIB needs to come from the top down with leadership setting the tone, holding themselves and their teams accountable. And when leaders prioritize DEIB, they allocate the resources, AKA funding, um, and establish clear metrics for success. It sends a powerful message throughout the organization that DEIB is not just another initiative, it's a core value that will be upheld by the company. I'm reading all of the comments in the chat. You might Mm -hmm. wanna open it up. 
uh, because they're really good. And you're making me think a lot about, um, you know, a lot of times people associate DEIB with just, you know, hiring diverse talent. But what really makes people leave the workplace or not thrive, not get to the next level, it's it's really about like the practices and the culture of that organization. And mm-hmm. I think in particular for, you know, if we just talk about Black women, you know, your ability to raise your hand and say, this is what my experience is and I'm not comfortable with it, you know, that is often where it becomes worse and not better for that that woman who's actually having the courage to talk about it, right? So, you know, we can we can talk about, you know, setting goals and we can talk about consequences, but it's like, you know, I just think about the ability for someone to even voice what they're experiencing at a baseline feels like we're not there uh, and not have that have a consequence you know, for the individual who is being microaggressed or who's, you know, and and it definitely starts from the top down, but it's, um, you know, having that um, just very clear, like what what is tolerated, the the anti-racism is being talked about and, and really cascaded across the organization and owned by everyone. because I think all of these like top line um, measurements, they don't really s- often speak to the direct experience of, you know, the individual, you know, who's navigating this day in and day out. And that's just where my my head and heart always go to is like, what's, what's happening day to day? Um, and I think that's, I'm not going to ask you to, to come up with the answer for it, um, but it feels like that's also, you know, where we need to put our focus as, again, we enter into this next election cycle and every day of our lives. Um, and there's just so many great comments in the chat. Uh, also, people sharing what's happening inside their organizations. I love the the comment. I'm trying to find it right now about I often share this acronym for nice, nice equals not inclined to critically examine. Um, agree with that, Andre. Um, a couple of questions in the chat. Fiamma, can you speak to the advantage DEI goals have on an organization? Someone above said, need to see this, need to see the money. And I have seen with previous organizations that leadership doesn't fully understand the value of these efforts what outcomes can we share with leadership to show how valuable these efforts are? I know where that question came from and I just wanna say, hey, Alyssa. Um, And also challenge this group to do the research, right? Because there are hundreds of millions of dollars that have been invested in doing the research on how diverse teams benefit organizations. They perform better hand over fist. Uh, revenue-wise, uh, culturally, innovation, that that's those aren't my opinions. These are things that I learned from a quick Google search. So if money is the concern, right, about companies being able to earn the money, diverse teams outperform homogenous teams. It's fairly simple. Yeah. There's another question here that I want to find for you. Hold on, sorry for the real time scrolling. Um, just had it, now I didn't read it with it. Um, I'm just reading some of the comments then out loud. We need to recognize and broadcast how we're all part of an ecosystem now more than ever. DEIB needs to be seen as everyone's job, not just one person's or a few people. Right absolutely it won't change without the support i mean i'm even thinking like as you are answering all these questions like this is this is a huge weight for you to be educating all of us right now and and i can't thank you enough for doing this but it's you know it's it's not your job to do it um and you and i agreed to do this because we we wanted to hold this discussion um and and really you know elevate this but everyone on this call is just as responsible as you are um, 
Here's a question. Do you think the most systemically marginalized employees should start at higher wages with better benefits to account for the on the job aggression stressors they will likely encounter? I've never heard that question posed. That before. is a good question. I think it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, do I think folks that are more marginalized. Can you repeat that question? Should they get yeah. more money starting at the base? Yeah. Level? Should they start at higher wages with better benefits to account for the on the job aggression stress stressors they will likely encounter? When you said you wanted to have this conversation, Sarah, I told you it was going to get spicy. Here <laughs> we are at, at spice. Um, yes, I do. <laughs> I absolutely do. Um, Me too. Especially to account for the documented pay discrepancies of marginalized communities versus non-marginalized communities. Um, we can call it reparations if we want, but yes, to answer your question, I do. Well, it's that, but then it's also, if you think about what you were just discussing around all of the data shows that more diverse teams produce greater outcomes, that investment you know, should pay off. Yeah. Um, and certainly higher mental health benefits um, as someone just said, the microaggressions alone will drive you mad. Um, I've heard folks consider diversity hiring as reverse racism. How would you address that? Um, you, you can pass on questions, Shil. <laughs> no, no, I don't wanna pass on that one. I just wanted to be thoughtful about my response. Um, there's no such thing as reverse racism oppressed groups cannot be racist. So <laughs> I'm laughing because one of the comments is nah. <laughs> and, and yes, to <laughs> echo Sheena, nah, that's, that's not a thing. Um, I, I would love to understand more about that question and have additional context with the question that was asked. Reverse racism does not exist marginalized oppressed communities do not have the power to create systemic uh, oppression to keep mm -hmm. people disenfranchised. So not a thing. Yeah, agreed. Um, how can we ensure we are being inclusive as it's not visible? I think that sort of goes back to the comment that I was making about um, you know, just as an example, if, you know, some of these microaggressions are happening every day and it takes someone's willingness to elevate it, you know, be willing to raise their hand and say, this is happening to me. Right. So I think sometimes it, it is invisible. And so how do we ensure that, I mean, that's the greatest fear, right? That this is happening and you don't know about it or you haven't set up the systems, I, I suppose, to support people. Like how, what would you suggest to create more of that visibility, right? I, I think asking people about their experience, the employees about their experience is a good start and creating a mechanism where they can trust that it is a an anonymous, blind um survey to capture their experience talking to people mm. is the, the first step mm -hmm. and i know there are some hr professionals that are actually against blind uh data because they want to create a culture where people can deliver feedback um, and feel safe to deliver feedback and the truth of the matter is people do not feel safe to share their experiences they feel like there will be retaliation or negative consequences to doing so so i i think that's the first step but I also want to challenge the people on the call to take a look around their immediate circle and their group of quote unquote friends at work. Do you have anyone that doesn't look like you that you ask them about their experiences to yeah. understand uh, what's going on in their world? And if everybody around you looks like you, you're part of the problem. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. It's one thing that I learned at a very early age because my father was an employment lawyer and he mainly represented women and people of color that were being discriminated against at work. And so he, I mean, it was drilled into my head at 10 years old that 
it is not safe for people to talk about what's happening to them because it often results in more of the same or the ultimate consequence losing their job. And so if you don't think that that's been passed down from generation to generation or somebody just knowing from their own lived experience um, that that is the threat and you still have to you know, support yourself and your family often in these circumstances, that's why it's just, you know, it's, um, you know, what you just said, it's, it's about, you know, I, I think about it from like the role of a manager, you know, we, we can't control everyone that we hire within our organizations, but creating that safety for people to have that trust and relationship so that they, they do have someone. It's actually one of the reasons that we introduced the only matching that we have at Bravely is identity matching. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's for this very reason. It's even in a coaching environment where everything is confidential, nothing can be tied back to you. It was very clear that people were still hesitant to enter into conversations with someone that didn't share their identity. Now, that doesn't mean that they have the same lived experience, but in creating the opportunity for a Black woman to have a Black female coach, um, it's just open doors for people to have a different level of support uh, that they ordinarily wouldn't have access to um, and, you know, hopefully create some of these safe spaces that we're talking about here. Um, feels like we need another hour with all these questions. Um, I'd like to go to Melanie's question. She asks, does an organization ever arrive at achieving DEIB? Melanie, to answer your question, it, it's ongoing work and it doesn't stop and a company knows that they're making progress to achieving diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging by measuring their goals, by identifying uh, their employees' experience to make sure they actually feel like they belong when they are brought into the company. Um, but the work doesn't stop, not at all. So before we wrap today, I do wanna talk more about what, you're doing it more in terms of how you're working with organizations, because there's a lot of other initiatives and companies out there that are just focused on women at large. And what you're doing is very different um, and high impact. So how are you partnering with organizations um, so that people here who are interested in potentially working with you can, can understand more about what you do? We're dedicated to partnering with organizations to create more inclusive and equitable workplaces. And it, I have to recognize, and I think everybody on the call probably recognizes that there aren't many Black women in their corporations for their more junior reps or junior folks to learn from and be mentored by. So more steps into this space as a beacon of hope and our comprehensive approach involves offering a wide range of resources, including curated courses, uh, workshops, webinars, group and one-on-one -on -one mentorship programs, and in-person events, all specifically tailored and designed for Black women in their early and mid-careers. These resources are meticulously designed to provide guidance on navigating workplace challenges that we experience, developing essential skills, and advancing their careers. Our commitment is fostering a supportive community for Black women in corporate America and tech, and it goes beyond just traditional resources, right? Our members have access to our exclusive private community where they can connect with and collaborate with other Black women who may have encountered similar challenges in their careers. Our community provides a safe space and supportive space for Black women to remove those metaphorical masks that they have to wear for survival in their workplaces, give them an opportunity to openly discuss our experiences and be empowered to break down barriers. By offering both online and offline support, we ensure that more members have access to continuous growth, learning, and connection throughout their professional journeys. We understand that businesses thrive when their employees are empowered, engaged, and supported. And by partnering with us, organizations can expect to see a significant increase in their workplace culture, um, productivity and retention rates. And our tailored resources and supportive community are not just an investment in the professional growth of black women, 
Um, they're an investment in the overall success and diversity of the organization itself. And when you prioritize the unique needs of Black women in the workplace, you foster a more inclusive and innovative environment, ultimately driving better outcomes, better, better business outcomes, excuse me. And as we wrap up, <laughs> for the folks on the call, I'd love if you're willing to connect with you directly. Uh, your perspective and insights as HR professionals um, on how more can better support you in championing the professional growth and well-being of your Black women employees are invaluable. I'd love to set up time to discuss and work with each of you. And thank you for allowing me to share more about more, pun intended. Mm. <laughs> Yama, you don't need me to say this, but what you're doing is so important. Every company should be working with you. Um, and investing in the Black women within their organization because they need this. They need the safety. They need the mentorship. Um, and they deserve it, right? The access um, to get, you know, this, this level of investment and what you're doing is just incredible. And I'm so thankful that you were here today. We covered a lot of ground. There's so much more for us to cover, but I know it's not easy to, to be the person that's just, you know, continuing to raise this. And I want to just, again, restate for this audience, because you've all been amazing and engaged. Like, let's, let's be the beacon of change together and take what you shared today. Um, and turn it into action because we're going to need it. <laughs> I mean, we already need it, but we're going to need it in, in the next year. Um, here are the codes for those of you um, that want to get credit for this conversation um, and join us again. Hopefully we can do this another one of these in the future. Please reach out, get your companies investing in this. That is my message. Um, as we go forth. Have a great rest of your week, everyone. Uh, and again, thank you so much, Fiamma, for sharing all your wisdom and insight with thank us. Thank you, everyone, for listening. <laughs> Have a great day.